Speaking at the Old Bailey while summing up in a murder trial, Mr Justice Channel addressed the jury and told them, On the fingers of your hands and mine at the time of birth there are certain lines and no two persons are alike. It's very wonderful. In the same way no two faces are exactly alike and no two sheep in a flock. In today's world of DNA and CSI forensic, this simple explanation of a new technology may seem somewhat outdated, but once sceptical lawyers and counsel saw it as reliable evidence, it would become accepted without question in court. Soon it would lead to many convictions and help bring some of the country's worst criminals to justice. In episode 30 of Tales from the Hangman's Record, we looked at the case for 22-year-old Peter Griffiths, hanged for the brutal murder of a child, snatched from a hospital in the north of England in the late spring of 1948. As we saw, Griffiths was arrested after a mass fingerprinting operation involving every male over the age of 16 in the town of Blackburn, with the killer being one of over 42,000 whose prints were taken and checked by specially trained fingerprint officers. By the spring of 1940, fingerprinting had long been established as reliable evidence and had led to numerous murder convictions, but it was less than 50 years earlier that the first of these in a murder case based on fingerprint evidence was secured. And even then the prosecution had a job convincing the jury of the validity of their case. The idea that each person's fingerprint was individual had been identified as early as Roman times. And in ancient China, important letters often had a fingerprint made in a wax seal to verify the identity of the sender. Although advances in the recognition and classification were developing across the world, with pioneers such as Bertillon, Galton and Vesetic all making strides to use fingerprinting in solving criminal cases, it wasn't until the 1890s that some form of reliable classification was devised. At the turn of the last century, Edward Henry, later to be Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, created what became known as the Henry system that helped classify the characteristics of prints more easily to enable swift elimination and identification when comparing prints. Although fingerprint evidence was first used in a French court to convict a murderer in 1902 and to solve a case of housebreaking in London later that same year, the first use of fingerprint evidence on a murder case in a British court involved two brothers, Alfred and Albert Stratton, and took place in the spring of 1905. The story begins in the early hours of Monday the 27th of March at Chapman's Oil and Colour Shop at 34 High Street, Deptford, South London. Arriving for work at just after 8.30, shop assistant William Jones was surprised to find the shutter still down and the door locked. Manager Thomas Farrow and his wife Anne lived in the flat upstairs and to cater for the early starting tradesmen, Tom Farrow would usually awake at dawn and had opened the paint and decorating store for customers by 7 o'clock. Sensing something was amiss, Jones went to speak to the landlord of the shop at the main Greenwich store and returning with another worker, managed to gain entry through a rear window and was horrified at the sight that greeted him. 71-year-old Tom Farrow lay dead on the floor in the back room of the shop. He had been battered to death. Upstairs in the bedroom, his wife Anne, six years younger, lay semi-conscious on the heavily blood-stained divan. She too had been battered about the head. The police were quickly summoned and it was clear that the motive for the vicious attack was robbery. The cash box that held the float and the day's takings had been forced open and its contents, around £13, had been taken. On the floor lay a couple of coins that the attacker must have dropped when rifling the metal box. Left at the sea were two crudely made rope and lead coshes and a pair of masks fashioned from a pair of ladies' stockings. On the edge of the cash box was a bloody fingerprint. Although fingerprint technology was very much in its infancy, detectives realised that a positive match could help to secure a conviction. Chief Inspector Fred Fox of Scotland Yard had the investigation and assigned his fingerprint expert, Detective Inspector Charles Stockley Collins, to look at the evidence. Collins examined the print on the cash box and determined it had been left by a thumb, almost certainly from the right hand. To try to eliminate the print, Collins compared it with those of Thomas and Anne Farrow and also Detective Sergeant Albert Atkinson, the only police officer to handle the box at the scene of the crime. And Collins was soon able to satisfy himself that the print did not belong to any of those people. 
Following the successful conviction in the burglary case three years earlier, the Fingerprint Bureau at Scotland Yard had already amassed around 80,000 sets of prints on file, and after a patient check and comparison, there was no match to be found. Four days after the murderous attack, Anne Ferrell succumbed to her injuries without regaining consciousness. And in the meantime, as detectives continued their investigation, a number of witnesses came forward. They learned that on the Monday morning, 11-year-old Alfred Russell, a milkman's assistant, had seen two men leave the shop at around 7am. Seeing that they had left the shop door open, the young lad whistled to attract their attention and shouted they hadn't closed the door. One of the men addressed him coolly and said, well that's alright. Sensing something about the appearance seemed suspicious, coupled with the speed at which they made off, he voiced his concerns to the milkman, saying, those men look like robbers. Arriving home after finishing the milk round, he was having breakfast before school when he told his mother what he'd seen at the paint shop. When his mother heard about the murder later that morning, she went to the police station. Alfred Russell was in the classroom when a police officer called to take his statement and get a description of the two men. The young lad was quite vague in his description, but said that one of the men had a moustache and wore a bowler hat, the other had a cap and brown boots. News of the violent murder and robbery made all the national newspapers, with the killers sensationally dubbed the mass murderers, and speculation locally as to the identity of the two men was rife. Soon the police had two names in the frame. Former professional boxer Harry Littlefield said that he had seen two brothers behaving strangely on the morning of the murder. Alfred and Albert Stratton were a pair of local petty thieves, and Littlefield said Alfred seemed to be hiding something under his coat as he passed them in the high street close to the shop. A woman named Ellen Stanton was on her way to work and told detectives she had seen the shopkeeper leaning on the door of the shop as if dazed, and a short time later saw two men running down Deptford High Street. As the shop was locked, it was assumed that Farrow had gone back inside and the door had closed behind him, and he had then collapsed. She said that would have been about quarter past seven, and the description she gave of the clothing matched that given by the other witnesses. She also recognised one of the men as Alfred Stratton, who she had occasionally seen in a local pub and someone her soldier boyfriend was on nodding terms with. The Stratton brothers were well known to the local police. 22-year-old Alfred was a well-known footballer who played for the Deptford Football Club. Albert, his younger brother by two years, was a much stockier ex-naval stalker and more prone to violence than his older sibling. Detectives visited an address in Brute Mill Road, Deptford, and spoke to Alfred's girlfriend, Hannah May Cromarty. Sporting the bruise from a fearful beating he had inflicted upon her, Anna was happy to tell police what she knew. She said Alfred had been walking in the early hours of Monday the 22nd of March by his brother tapping on the window. She heard them whispering about doing something and Alfred quickly dressed and left the house. When he returned, Stratton warned her to say that he'd been home all night. She said that he smelled strongly of paraffin and later, after reading about the murder in the newspaper, Alfred had tried to alter the colour of his brown boots with black boot polish. He'd also given away the pair of trousers he'd been wearing that night. And with this, and as the various testimonies had all put Albert and Alfred Stratton near the scene of the crime on the morning of the murder, warrants were issued for the arrest of both men. A check on the brothers found that both had vanished from their usual haunts. Albert's landlady was interviewed and told police she had once seen a pair of silk stockings that had been cut down to form masks underneath Albert's bed. Shown the two masks found at the scene, she confirmed they looked identical. The hunt for the brothers continued and Alfred was picked up at the King of Prussia public house on Monday the 3rd of April. On the following day, Albert was arrested at a dress in Stepney. Both men were taken to Tower Bridge Police Station and fingerprinted. When Detective Inspector Collins received the two sets of prints from the Stratton brothers, he compared them to the prints on the cash box and concluded that it matched exactly with the right thumbprint of Alfred Stratton. The two were remanded before Coroner Henry Oswald at Greenwich Magistrates Court. They showed great indifference to the charges and laughed and joked with friends in the public gallery during the several appearances at the court. At the final remand hearing, the coroner's jury returned a verdict of willful murder and the men were arraigned to stand trial at the Old Bailey. As Mrs Stratton was leaving the court, she turned to her boys and sobbed, Oh Alfred, if you have done this, you have killed me. The two brothers stood side by side in the dock before Mr Justice Channel at the Old Bailey on Friday the 5th of May. 
At the outset, Prosecution Counsel Richard Muir told the jury that the fingerprint evidence, the thumbprint found on the cash box, was crucial. One fact of great significance remains. Upon the cash box at the house where the Farrells were murdered was found a fingerprint. A photograph of the fingerprint was forwarded to Inspector Collins at Scotland Yard. The inspector compared it with a print taken from the right thumb of Alfred Stratton. It was found to be identical. Both men denied being involved. Later that first day, their mother was called to give evidence. Both the accused burst out crying as she entered the witness box. She turned her back on them and sobbing violently as she faced Muir's questioning. She said that on the evening of the murder, Albert called to her house and left, saying he was going to the Empire Theatre. She could not testify to his whereabouts after the curtain came down. Asked about his character, in broken tone, she told how he had once deserted from the Navy two years ago and had later been discharged for insubordination. While Alfred Stratton quickly recovered his composure, his brother Albert continued to cry with his face in his hands. Regarding the fingerprint evidence, there was a certain amount of scepticism from both the Defence Council, the press and members of the public on the reliance of this thus far untried technology. Prosecutor Muir called witnesses who placed the Stratton brothers at the scene of the murder shortly before the bodies were discovered. The court also heard the accused men's girlfriends testify that they were not with them at the time of the murder. The Crown called William Gittings, an officer at Brixton Prison, where the Stratton brothers were confined prior to the trial. Gittings related a conversation he had had with Albert Stratton, who said, I reckon he, Alfred, will get strung up and I shall get about 10 years. He has led me into this. Muir told the jury that that statement would be counted as a confession. Inspector Collins told the court how effective the fingerprint system was, stating that the fingerprint department had over 80,000 sets of prints on file and every print could be shown to be different. He explained in layman's terms how fingerprinting worked as a means of identification and showed how the fingerprint on the cash box matched that of the elder brother. To demonstrate, he asked for a member of the jury to volunteer to be fingerprinted to show the difference between the different sets of prints. In attempting to discredit this evidence, the defence called Dr John Garson, president of the Anthropometry Society. Unfortunately for the Strattons, Dr Garson was discredited as a witness when it's revealed he'd offered his services to both the prosecution and the defence and basically testified for the ones who paid him the most. Mr Justice Channel remarked, after writing two such letters, Dr Garson must be seen as an absolutely untrustworthy witness. In his summing up on the following evening, the judge said he did not think the jury should convict on the fingerprint evidence alone. He pointed out that although the fingerprint evidence linked Alfred Stratton to the cash box, there was other evidence from witnesses that put them outside the scene of the murder shortly before the bodies were discovered. With the defence in tatters following the rejection of Dr Garston's evidence, it took the jury little over two hours of deliberation to find both Alfred and Albert Stratton guilty of murder and they were sentenced to death by hanging. The brothers were removed from the court and taken to Wandsworth Prison, with Tuesday the 23rd of May scheduled for their execution, just eight weeks after committing the murder. John Billington, son of the Victorian executioner James Billington, and youngest of his three sons, was engaged to carry out the execution. There was some confusion of the appointing of the assistant when the other number one hangman on the list, Henry Pierpoint, wrote to the Under Sheriff of London and the Governor of Wandsworth offering his services for the position of executioner. Pierpoint received word back from the Sheriff's office that Billington had been appointed, but he would like him to act as the assistant. This was contrary to the way things normally worked, as it was the Under-Sheriff who engaged the hangman and the Governor of the prison responsible for selecting the assistant. Then, Pierpoint received a letter from the prison stating that they had selected John Ellis to be the assistant. Pierpoint wrote to the Governor explaining he had already been engaged by the Under-Sheriff to act as the assistant. The Governor replied, by saying he would respect that decision, but he would still be employing Ellis as a second assistant. Arriving at the jail on the Monday afternoon, the hangmen were furnished with the usual particulars of the two men and went to observe them in their cells. It was found that Albert, the younger brother, had been led astray by Alfred's influence, and while there may have been a certain amount of sympathy for him, little had been done in the way of effort to secure a reprieve. Albert occupied a large condemned cell in the middle of the prison. He spent his time since confinement sketching and drawing and had just finished writing a last letter to friends when the hangman spied on him 
and they were able to get a good view of him as he walked nervously backwards and forwards across the cell. They noted there was no bravado about him, rather just a calm, sorrowful look on his face. Alfred Stratton occupied the cell directly above his brother, and as they climbed the cast iron staircase and peered into the cell, Pierpont noted he didn't wake at any of the same emotions he had felt for the younger brother. With their calculations, they went down to the scaffold to prepare the ropes. Albert, a stocky 172 pounds, was given a drop of 6 foot 6 inches. Alfred, some 25 pounds lighter, was given a drop a foot more. With the sign bags loaded, ready for the practice drop, Pierpoint knelt down on the large oak doors and in chalk scribbled Albert and Alfred under the appropriate noose. On the following morning, the prison was silent and even the warders walked across the landing as if on tiptoes. On a signal from the governor, they entered the cell of Albert and led him into the corridor. Pierpoint noted he was placid and tractable and in seconds they led him into the corridor, leaving him for a moment in the care of the prison escort. Alfred, who had been moved to an adjacent cell after breakfast, had a surly look on his face, but offered no resistance. Not a word was spoken as a procession was formed and headed down the corridor towards the scaffold, only the quiet voice of the priest breaking the heavy silence. The hangman followed a pace behind the brothers, both with necks bird for the rope, with an officer either side. As they walked down the staircase along the path, they headed towards the execution shed, and as the procession came into view, the door was flung open. Albert was escorted to the rope nearest the lever, while Alfred stood to his right. As the hangmen busied themselves, the silence was broken by Albert. Alfred, he said in a loud voice, his pale face half turning to where his white-capped brother stood. Have you given your heart to God? For a moment there was no response, then in a muffled whisper he replied, yes. Pierpoint noted later that how on the very jaws of death, the younger brother's last thoughts were more concerned for his brother than his own. Albert Stratton died instantly, but it's recorded that in the case of Alfred, there was muscular spasms when he fell, and the LPC form noted there was evidence he had died of asphyxia. The trial of the Stratton brothers proved to be a watershed moment in forensic science. So intriguing was the new technology of fingerprinting that newspapers ran detailed descriptions of the technique. One remarked that with the rapid rise with which fingerprint identification had gained acceptance in court, it must now be considered the criminal's deadliest enemy. My name is Steve Fielding. Thank you for watching and listening to another episode of Tales from the Hangman's Record. If you have enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe to the channel to keep up to date with new content. Check out my website, stevefielding.com, where you can find out more information on my books and order copies of the Hangman's Record trilogy at a special discount price. My latest book, Tales from the Hangman's Record Volume 1, is available on Amazon as a paperback and also a Kindle download. Look out for my podcast channels, Tales from the Hangman's Record, and also Mostly Murder, which will start broadcasting in the summer. Please use the comments below for your thoughts on this case and for suggestions for further episodes in this series.